three materials, so air, ice, and, 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 and water, are very well known, of course, so important materials to the human life that their dielectric properties, I mean, conductivity, permittivity, magnetic properties, all are very well studied and, and on different uh, frequency ranges, they are known. But now the question was to me, what is the dielectric constant, or rather would say permittivity of snow? Of course, it depends how much there is ice, how much there is liquid water, how, how, how I mean, porous it is and so on. And of course, perhaps also on the internal structure, what kind of grains are there? So this is what why I became very interested a long time ago and been working on this thing. And now I, let me give you a couple of formulas. These are not very difficult ones. Even I think that may, maybe some of you have seen these in, in, in your studies before. Um, uh, the, but before showing the formulas, I would, in a way, give you my philosophy or picture how this, I call this homogenization, you could say that um, it is like assigning effective parameters to materials like snow, for example, be our prime example, but that it could be other, other ones. I mean, engineered materials. Today we talk about metamaterials and, and, and very often so in, in, in say, um, uh, radar applications, people try to somehow artificially build materials with certain given uh, electric and magnetic properties in order to say reduce reflection or increase reflection or, or whatever. So in a way the history of this business, in a way this uh, a play in five act is, is not mine, it is, sorry, it is my good friend Christian Brosseau there down wrote a nice article about this, uh, and I, I then, then continued on that on, on another later article. But this five act like like splitting this into five uh, stages. First, I will talk about so-called Maxwell Garnet mixing principle, and then something more, more advanced Bruggemann, and then the third stage or act was 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 in, in the 60s when when um, many articles were um, and, and studies uh, tried to uh, reach for what are the limits i mean if you have a snow sample and you shake it it has the same uh, density and same other properties but perhaps it's it's permittivity changed due to the fact that the the, the, the uh, position of the grains changed, but there are some limits and bounds. So this is the third bullet, I, I'll talk about that. Then there is a very important thing, so-called percolation, uh, in a way how, how suddenly and very unexpectedly the macroscopic properties like the permittivity or effective conductivity may change when the uh, primary structural parameters make a little change. And then, of course, in the late last century, the computation, the, the computer power was increasing so that these kind of computations could be done in a much faster way. So this is my philosophy. I'd like to go from history to the present day rather than just showing you the, the today's results, which may be quite then dense. But I hope you would then learn from this. So I mentioned this term Maxwell Garnet. So what is Maxwell Garnet? Uh, I'll first tell you one thing. You know, James Clerk Maxwell was the father of electromagnetics who in the 1860s found wrote these equations and then of course in the late 1880s Heinrich Hertz was able to experimentally prove that they that the radio waves behave like light so that was James Kirk Maxwell but however why people think that this famous mixing formula that I will very soon tell you is by Maxwell in fact, it is not. This Maxwell Garnet is a person 
And there is an interesting story behind this. Namely, Maxwell, you know, he lived from 1831 to 79, unfortunately died very early, 49, 48 years of age. He had an assistant called Garnet. And Garnet was adoring Maxwell so much that he wrote the biography of Garnet. And even then when he got a son, he gave his son the name James Clerk Maxwell. So this guy, James Clerk Maxwell Garnet, became also a scientist and wrote this formula. So it is by this James Clerk Maxwell Garnet, the son of the assistant of, 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 of Maxwell. So the question is the following. Let's take, now I have a simple picture here of a heterogeneous medium. I just take homogeneous background with permittivity. So remember now I'm talking about electric um, electric um, uh, uh, parameter, you know that the displacement field, so, so the, the flux density to the electric field. So, so these ball phase things are vectors, electric field, volts over meter, this is the displacement, ampere second over meter squared. So depending on the material, the permittivity is there. So we have a homogeneous background, say air or water or whatever, with epsilon like the environment here, environment. And then I have spherical inclusions, could be randomly here. And their um, permittivity is epsilon i, like inclusion. So the question is this one, uh, how to homogenize, how, what would be the same size sample with the homogeneous permittivity, epsilon, effective permittivity, which would respond to, to electric excitation exactly like this one. So some kind of equivalence. So that is a question of finding out this one. So, so the question is, and I show now your very simple way how to do that. So the, uh, the average electric field, okay, if we say that we know what is the field inside the spheres, of course, in the random medium, it is complicated, but let's take it simple. We have the background field, environment field, and the inside field. And then let's say that, okay, the average is, of course, how much, how many percentage of volume is there of the inclusion? So say 10%, 0.1. Now I cannot, for example, then this, the environment is 0 0.9 or whatever. Now I, my, my pen doesn't work too, too well, but it, don't, don't worry about that. So then the other question is, what is the average D, the displacement? Why? Of course, it is just like the same thing. The average inside field there, and then the average outside field, uh, or the environment. I guess you get this. And then the only thing what we need to know is what is the inside to the outside of the field. And this is a simple Laplace equation solution. So a sphere with permittivity epsilon i in background epsilon e, its internal field is smaller to the same direction, and there is the ratio of the one that you see here. So if you plug this in, what happens is that then you get a formula, very simple formula for, the, for this um, effective permittivity here. So depending on the environment, the inclusion, and then also on the on the on the volume fraction. F remember F is if F is zero, we get epsilon e. So there are no inclusions. If F is one, then you can easily see that epsilon effective becomes epsilon i because it is hundred percent inclusion. So very simple, a very crude way, but fascinatingly ex. I mean, um, uh, uh, powerful formula. I'll I'll show you. So uh, and then, by the way, this is the year when, when Maxwell Garnet showed this. So, but now somebody might ask that, okay, but in dynamics, we are microwave engineers and, and, and there we have waves which have, uh, are not static, rather, I mean, they, they, they vary with 1 billion times per second, gigahertz. 
So the question is that what is the range of validity of this one? So as you know, the, in a way, the near field and the statics are connected. So the question is that the wavelength, which for say uh, giga, one gigahertz field is 30 centimeters. If our uh, microstructure here, my snow, it is only of millimeters. So it is 30 times smaller than the wavelength. So then, I, then it's, it, it shows that this is quite valid. But when we increase the frequency, meaning that we have uh, smaller and smaller resolution, then of course, that is no longer homogeneous. So this is the question that we, we should have the, the, the D, which would be the average, I mean, this uh, correlation length or the size of the spheres or so has to be smaller than the wavelength. But the question is how much? So uh, my, my message to you is that you can safely use this formula for, for, for low frequency solutions, quasi-static solutions, like my snow, snow things are there. However, remember now I started from the spherical assumption of the geometry. If it is no longer spherical, which of course it is in, in practical light, then we have to do something else. But, but we can we can do that so but the question is that how does it happen for the not, not only the where the the d size but also the 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 uh, volume practice remember this f which is between zero and one is the uh, volume of the inclusions divided by the total volume. So that also has the effect. And that's, I, 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 I now give you the next thing. So, so remember this Maxwell Garnet was, is quite an old one. Oh, now what happens with my pen? Like this, but then in the 1930s, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Bruggemann, that guy, then studied that if you have very dense mixtures, then, then there are like you cannot separate between the host and the guest or the inclusion and the environment. But you, he looked for a more symmetric uh, result. And this is quite, you can see that it is very symmetric. You just weigh the, in a way, one effect of the environment by its volume fraction with the similar to the inclusion and require that their effects cancel each other. So what I did, this is a, a, where you can then compute the effective permittivity as a function of this volume fraction for, for now I'm, uh, here on the left hand side, as you can see, I start with air and I put their inclusions which have permittivity two. So obviously, this is a very dull curve going from one to two. And you can see that then the predictions by Maxwell Garnett and Bruckemann are fairly similar. However, if I increase the contrast so that epsilon i is 10 epsilon e, then they start to diverge, they will be very different results. Brueggemann overtakes the Maxwell Garnet. So you might say that, oh, this is a disappointment. I would like to have a recipe for my design if I want to design a mixture to have a certain permittivity, which do I trust? So here I have one, uh, even one more example. If I allow these to be lossy. So here I have epsilon being um, complex with a very strong imaginary part. As you know, the losses come to the imaginary part of the permittivity. Then these two curves become very different. And if they are extremely lossy, they, they will be so-called percolation things and so on for the Brueggemann thing. So very different. So this is, this is bad news in a way. It's, but let me give you one, one, one piece of, 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 of consolation. Uh, 
uh, with this is long time ago, 20 years ago, we did some studies on wanted to do that and with that time computers were not so powerful up today but but anyway we did quite a nice nice study the study was the following we made monte carlo simulations putting like an air background and then very high permittivity uh, inclusions as you can see 51 is the contrast so that we could see a very clear difference between the predictions of Maxwell Garnet and Bruckemann. Oh, let's see, Maxwell Garnet, which is this one. Oh. This one here, Maxwell Garnet. And this one here, and then Bruckemann, which is here. So let's take a look at the left hand side. There we did lots of simulations just by randomly putting spheres with 51 permittivity and then computing the exactly the 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 the, the, the geometry with the uh, computer i mean numerically solving the thing and then computing what are then all these values for given 20 percent inclusions sometimes it is like this sometimes that because they are different they are like children which is have a, of a, of a different personality. But anyway, they fall very closely to the Maxwell Garnet. And now the point was that this was without clustering. What is clustering? It meant that we put a sphere into the background, then we put another sphere randomly, but then when it starts becoming full, then it may happen that a new sphere touches another sphere. So then we didn't allow that. We, we dropped that away and put another sphere so that nobody was touching each other. So that is without clustering. However, if we allow clustering, meaning that when a new sphere comes and touches the other one, we leave it. So there will be a, like a, a touching double sphere or even triple sphere and so on. So if you allow this, then you can see that these values scatter quite much more. But the fact is that here, without clustering, we are very close to Maxwell Garnet with clustering near Brueggemann. Of course, not exactly because this is a, uh, not an exactly solvable problem, but a very good rule of thumb then for you if you play in this business of, of effective media model. Very nice. So now I take another view, and this is, I am so proud of this, this is very fascinating. Uh, uh, I somehow now remind you that first I talked about this like a random medium. I have randomly positioned spheres in the medium. And then I had like an empirical formula, which works anyway quite nicely without clustering. Uh, but that is not an exact solution. Now I take another thing for which I have an exact solution. And this is the following. As you can see here, I have not a simple sphere, but the core shell structure. So sphere, uh, this is three-dimensional sphere, which has a spherical core with permittivity epsilon two and the shell epsilon one. And uh, for simplicity, this is in air. These are relative permittivities you know, relative permittivity divided by the epsilon zero, which is the free space permittivity. And now we have one, sim one single parameter here is the, or two parameters, which is the relative sizes of the core and shell, two radius and two times the radius B, two times the radius A. Now the question is that, what is the, if I put here an electric field, so then you know that there will be, a, this can be replaced by a dipole moment. Dipole moment P, which creates a scattered field like this. So the question is, what is the dipole moment as a function of these internal parameters? So this is the so-called polarizability. Alpha is the polarizability, which is the, measure of how strong the dipole moment for a given incident electric field is. 
And now I, I rather use so-called normalized polarizability because that has units of, of volume and, and ampere second of voltmeter. I want to keep it dimensionless. So in the following, remember, I will talk about the polarizability alpha, which for, for a homogeneous sphere is very simple. It is three times the permittivity of that homogeneous sphere minus one over epsilon plus two. I guess you know this. So if you solve this thing, it is a very simple, then you just need to solve the Laplace equation in the all the three uh, domains and, and use the boundary conditions. Then, of course, the alpha is dependent on the both um, the core and shell permittivities, but also then, of course, on the on the um, uh, uh, the relative size of the core. And now what is very fascinating is the thing that now if I use this result for the core shell sphere, and then I ask the question that what if I had, instead of this core shell sphere, I had a homogeneous sphere, which effective permittivity like this. Of course, it would have the normalized polarizability like this. So then I say that what if this one is the alpha of my last slide, and then I solve the effective permittivity from that formula. What happens is exactly the following. And that is exactly the maxwell garnet two-phase mixing formula where this thing here is the volume fraction, which is the volume fraction of the core material of the whole sphere. So this is this is quite well might say that okay that's that's nice but 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 what about that? So I think that it is exactly very important because now if those two results are the same then we have a hundred years of results of mixing formula. And we can use all those results due to the mathematical equivalence to internally homogenize core cell spheres, which are in today's nanotechnology is very important, this kind of core cell particles. And the other way around, we have analytical results for core cell particles. And then all oh, these results due to this equivalence are exactly valid for three dimensional. I mean, random materials with, of course, with these limitations that I talked to you before. And now I have three bullets here. I, I, I go to these bounds that I mentioned, remember my bounds. Uh, and then something like dispersion engineering. I talk to you about this dispersion. Disper well, you know, dispersion, it means that the, the electric response, say, permittivity changes with frequency temporal dispersion. And then something about cloaking applications, which have been quite important in, in, in metamaterial business. Let's start with the bounds. So the early bounds of the 1960s, what so-called hushing strickman bounds, were very simple in a way. I, I could, again, go back to the MG means Maxwell Garnet. Remember my Maxwell Garnet formula saying that I have now, say, air and green green water droplets like rain there so i can compute the effective permittivity by maxwell garnet formula but the same thing is then that i could invert that so saying that the green one is the background and the blue one is the inclusion i get a different result so the fascinating thing is that always no matter what kind of mixture there is <clears throat> the true permittivity is between these two, between the Maxwell Garnet, which is in a way a minimum, and then this inverse Maxwell Garnet, just replacing epsilon, changing epsilon i and epsilon e and f to one, one and f. So you get different results, and always the effective, no matter how you shake this, 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 and make a different sample. This is fascinating, and all the 60s, you can read this paper. Um, okay, so these are my terms, 
Swiss cheese and raising pudding due to the fact that, in a way, if you had air and something, something there. Oh, well, raising pudding is not in air, but, but no, anyway, you'll get the point. So now here is an example. I, I took, again, a simple mixture, background air, epsilon is one, and then quite strong contrast, 20. The red one, remember Maxwell Garnet is very low, but now the inverse or the complementary that I say here is the blue one. And then all those things should really uh, go in the, in the, in the, in the, between these two. And for example, here I have the Bruggemann, the green one, clearly is between those two. No, no big, big deal with that one. But then I have another, remember my first love, which was snow, uh, dry snow. Then it is quite simple because it is only air and ice. And ice is very, um, uh, uh, dispersionless in microwaves. Uh, 3.17 about this is the, is the relative permittivity. So as a function of snow density, I could then compute the effective permittivity using the Maxwell Garnet and the inverse Maxwell Garnet. And you can clearly see that all these measured points, these are by my good friend Christian Metzler, the, red, the black points, he has made a very careful measurement of dry snow. Clearly, they are there in the middle, and in fact, quite closely follow the <coughs> follow the Brueggemann solution. Of course, think about dry snow, air, and then spherical no snow droplets. It cannot; they have to touch each other. They cannot stay on the ground with, without touching. So that's cluster. All right. And then even with the lossy mixtures, they are even bigger, bigger differences there. The Maxwell Garnet, the red one, and the inverse Maxwell Garnet. Guggemann is there in the middle. So then, I mean, the thing is, remember what was my point? My point was that I was fascinated by the fact that this external homogenization, remember what I started with Maxwell Garnet, and then the internal homogenization by computing the effective uh, core shell, what would be the homogenization of that one, mean? that they are the same. Then it means that we can use those ashen strickman limits also for the design of polarizabilities. So if I had like uh, two and 10, just a computational example, then I can compute that the relative, the normalized polarizabilities are quite different. But then what I do, is that then if I take 50-50 mixture and put, put those both ways, then I can get something which is less and less and even more something like this. So there we have also the similar limits for the, for the polarizabilities, which then fall between those, uh, 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 those uh, hashin strickman bounds, which you have there, 1.59 and 1.78. For example, the, my, 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 what is one, two, three, four layer case for which we have, they fall between those two. I think that is not obvious and intuitive, even if now it seems quite, so what's the big deal here? But I think that that is very, very deep result. So that was number one, the bounce. Then I'll talk to you about the dispersion. Remember, dispersion means that uh, that the permittivity changes with 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 frequency. So to be more correct, is temporal dispersion. Then we have spatial dispersion, but that's not another story. And and in in I I think in micro engineering you are very familiar with say. Uh, uh, um, basic models like uh, Debye model for water, which means that it has high permittivity, low frequencies, and then goes low at high frequencies. Or then so-called um, Lorentz for solid state physics, solid state materials. These are like resonating um, uh, uh, materials. That there are, is some frequency around which there is a big change in permittivity. Or then Drude. Drude is, is the model for a solid 
uh, noble metals, gold and, and silver, meaning that I, I'll show you that later. So what is, is known in early um, mixing models is that if we have uh, drew the spheres, so, uh, so for example, silver spheres in background environment, then the effective medium is no longer drew, it becomes Lorentzian type resonances. Or if I have D by enclosures in, in, in dispersionless environment, like a good example is fog, rain. So air is dispersionless, and then you have spherical water droplets there, which are D by model. Then the mixture also is divided, but the relaxation region shifts very strongly. So this is important. But there are some other, other, other important things also, like the interfacial polarization. But I think I have to speed up a little bit because there are quite a lot still to, to talk to you. So now remember, my second bullet was this dispersion engineering. I hear said that we know this kind of very interesting things what have been valid for the external homogenization. Then due to the fact of the equivalence, it has to be also valid for the internal. So meaning take a core shell thing, and then for example, a core has a, has a Debye. By the way, this is the Debye uh, model, meaning that if you have a, a, a omega, zero you have statics then you have the static permittivity and if omega is very high then you have the infinite the high frequency permittivity and then of course this has to be also be debi due to the result that i took from the external business and so so the so called this tau tau here is the relaxation time which for water is something like 10 picoseconds depending on temperature but that changes also. Um, another example is very fascinating, is the um, thing that which is very, has been become very, uh, very, very important in, in, in these days of, of, of metamaterials and plasmonics and so on. So remember my, my three dimensional sphere, then I had the dipole moment, Remember my dipole moment I, is of course proportional to the, uh, the bigger the incident field is, but what is important is this material parameter, the normalized polarizability, how strongly it, it creates dipole moment. And remember for homogeneous isotropic dielectric sphere, it is like this. So, but what happens if epsilon is allowed to be negative? There is a singularity. So it means that if we have a, well, okay, how can you have negative permittivity? Why? So silver has negative permittivity in, in optical range. I'll show you some results. How many other, other, other plasmonic materials have that? So if you use the so-called Rude model, this is, you know, the Rude model. For example, ionosphere, we have the plasma frequency. So very high frequencies, there is not no effect, it is one. But low frequencies, at plasma frequency, this becomes zero, and below plasma frequency, it is negative permittivity, which means that the ionosphere is like metal for low frequencies. You cannot send to satellites radio wave with, say, 10 kilohertz or one, one megahertz. So is it to compute that there is a resonance depending on the plasma frequency, if you plug this there. So, and if you compute this, the silver sphere, its absolute value, of course, silver has, doesn't have exactly lossless. It has losses also, so this doesn't blow up to infinity, but there is some limit. So at certain close to ultraviolet, there will be a very strong response. And remember, this is quasi-static because, uh, because this silver particle is, say, 20 nanometers, and we are playing in optical regions, which is hundreds of nanometers. So it is small, but it is still resonance. So this is so-called electrostatic resonance or surface plasma. And in, in fact, that is exactly now using my 
very crude static model. But that is fascinatingly valid because if I do, I can of course do this solution for full dynamic solution. You know, there is the so-called me, me scattering result. And here now I have plotted the scattering static result, meaning here the, the these are now as a function of the wavelength and then the size of the sphere, the diameter D. D is here, D is this one. So if it's here, say 20 nanometer, so the static solution and the dynamic solution, they are practically the same. But when the diameter increases, then there is a shift and there are other multiples and so on. But anyway, for small, you, you can get wonderful results already from the Maxwell Garnet, all this uh, simple result. Okay, the full wave solution, I guess, I, I don't know whether you have, have, have the me scattering or Lorentz me scattering have been computing those, but these are com complicated. Uh, A and me coefficients are, have Wessel and, and Hunker functions and so on. But there are codes, codes to compute that. And I created my own code and then started to compute what would B now as a function of a single sphere who has negative permittivity like silver, but now I assume it is totally real and lossless. And now, now these contours or these colors show how strong the scattering efficiency is, so called scattering efficiency Q. How much how many times of its geometrical cross section it scatters energy and if it's white then it's strong if it's blue it is small and you can see here that we have we have this electrostatic resonances we had this minus two what i told you which we could see from maxwell guard business but there are also higher order things here one, uh, one minus one five minus one three three but they are thinner and thinner and you can they are so narrow and even small losses push them out very clearly, but, but in principle, they are there. So, um, okay, here is the silver thing. Practically, uh, there are losses. So, so, but anyway, you can see that the prime, prime goes to negative values, the real part of the permittivity, but then, then there is some losses, imaginary part. And here is one model that I have been using in my, my, my computations. And then, by the way, I don't know whether you know this uh, item. This is so-called Lycurgus cup from the late Roman times was found found somewhere in Europe. Now in in British Museum, I went to British Museum, and beautiful, beautiful ceramic cup. I took two pictures. Well, these you can these pick, much better pictures you can find in the internet if you look for Lucurgus Cup. But this I, I I wanted to do that myself. I looked that there was no no guard in the room. Then I took my camera. I took two pictures. I took the picture on the left with flash, the right without flash, and that is the same exactly the same cup. As you can see that. The transmit the, in the in the without flash, then of course there is light coming through this ceramic cup because it is not metal. And then the flash, it is mostly the reflection, and it is totally different color, meaning that the these they have studied that this has like a minor gold and silver nanoparticles inside this this ceramic, and they then create this dispersion. What I do, I get my point. Dispersion means that at different wavelengths, which correspond to different colors, there is a, a big difference in, 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 uh, in, in response. Another example I took from, from an article, not so recent anymore, but this is like a hollow gold nanospheres. So, so again, this core shell structure where you have gold here. And there you could change, you can see the resonance parameters very strongly. And then by naked eye, then also you can see that it is very different 
the same material, it has exactly the same amount of gold, but only the geometry is different there. The, the thickness and the, and the size of the hollow core. That is fascinating. So one thing is then to, to, to one might ask that, that's interesting, I want to make red instead of blue. So how to red sheet this one? So there are many ways. I mean, if you put a shell here, then using those my simple formulas, you can see that these resonances shift to higher wavelengths. So that is a red sheet. And here are some more calculations, but I need to hurry a little bit. Here, for example, I have again my optical wavelengths here. And then here is now the volume of the silver here. This says 20% means that there is 20% silver. And then the other one is, is just the dielectric medium. On the left hand side, we have silver core. And remember my previous slide, I could redshift that by putting a shell with dielectric. And clearly, um, uh, now, okay, if I increase the, the shell, I go here down, you can see that this goes to redshift. However, if the core is dielectric and the shell is, 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 is silver here, oh, nothing from my pen, then you can see that there, is, there are two, two um, resonances, the so-called mode how the hybrid is staged. There are like uh, resonances on top and on inside of the, uh, of the, of the shell. One is red shifting, one is blue shifting. And then of course, remember the red point that I can use these results for mod modifying uh, composites. So again, this is now, well, this is a regular structure, but anyway, uh, external homogenization. And then I could do that for say cloaking applications. For example, there are what is cloaking cloaking means that i have a say a, a, some material i want to make it invisible to electromagnetic field here here is a static case the the, the static potential from zero to one volt and then if i have material medium with two different materials i can design those so that outside there is no effect I can have two diff different types of those. You can see that the electric field is homogeneous. It is not homogeneous inside this one, but who cares because outside nobody can see that. So that is a so-called cloaking type of principle. And then again, it is easy to compute these using my uh, core shell formulas. And then of course, this then gives us the possibility to design transparent composites translate this thing, this, I mean, this uh, cloaking principle into the external homogenization. So the same thing, and then you can see that there is at, at certain, you might have, have the possibility of having, having the uh, cloak, at least in principle. Okay, so there are some, some uh, uh, results, I don't know, I, I have written a book, book about this one uh, long time ago, but there are these these things if you want to have some more 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 insight. Um, uh, I would have something still on the super sphere. I, I mean, about what would happen if we are not as a sphere. Ellipsoid can also be done, but recently we have been working on this kind of. Uh, um, platonic things like cube or octahedron or so on, and how these plasmonic resonances are affected there. We can shift, red shift, blue, blue shift those and, 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 oh, that is a long, oh, this is now dangerous. I hope my computer doesn't restart. Um, okay, well, these things I have been interested in, but, but I have, if you want to ask something more about these ones, so I, I'm happy, happy to answer and 
and and and we did some computations on on this how how the 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 permittivity the polarizabilities are affected and and many formulas we had but that was that time 20 years ago we only looked for positive permittivities but it happens that our formulas then are quite predict interesting things if i just allow the permittivity become negative my my student uh, dimitris saruchis who now is in, in university of pennsylvania also did quite a lot of computations for these ones and and identified these different resonances for the for the cubes and other other polyhedra so in that i would then like to perhaps here stop and 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 just conclude by saying that i i i talked about this play in five acts which was christian brosso's very nice uh, metaphor about the maxwell garnet remember more than hundreds ago Bruggemann, which was good for for dense mixtures then the boundings and the limits well about percolation i didn't talk too much i mentioned a couple of times and then using computations that was the fifth scene but now i i would like to say that we are now in the sixth epoch of this uh, play or this game where where we somehow have these new material properties emerging from material and geometry um, but that is then perhaps a topic for another story then that would mean that i would perhaps like to stop here and take take on your comments and questions thank you professor that was a very fascinating presentation so i don't see any questions right now so maybe the participants can mail you for questions but i have a question personally so yes. maybe if you would like to answer so sure. for root models we saw that epsilon the epsilon was given as 1 minus omega p by omega whole square so omega p is the yes. plasma frequency yes so my question is is this um, equation valid for very low frequencies or is this only for very high frequencies okay okay let's go back um Right, yeah, this drew the model. Absolutely. The, uh, 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 the, the, this model is quite simple to derive from, from, from the Ampere's law in Maxwell's equation, but that is, of course, a very idealized model. So we have a single electron which has, has the uh, uh, ability to move by the Newton's law. And then the, oh, the, 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 the plasma frequency is, 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 uh, is proportional to the, to these, um, uh, uh, the number density of these electrons and their mass and very, very simple thing. So in principle, that is absolutely uh, um, uh, a valid point. And indeed to, to very low frequencies, because then at low frequencies then the electrons just move with the with the electric field and there the, the, there is no they don't the resonance is not yet there to 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 bring it back so for example in i mentioned the ionosphere it is very well uh, uh, following this model the plasma frequency being something like 10 megahertz on which the radio ham amateurs are working very much because then it means that the electron density in 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 in, in ionosphere uh, is affecting this plasma frequency. But of course, in then silver and and metals, the electron density is much 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 higher. Uh, of course, ten to the what is it 22, 24 per per cubic uh, centimeter which means that then the plasma frequency goes to very high frequencies, uh, uh, optical and ultraviolet frequencies. But yes, the, the answer is that I, I think that it is very, very well valid. Of course, then there are losses also. Uh, and then very often people, you add, add there another loss term. So uh, for very low frequencies, suppose in microwave range, when we are considering like metals or conductors, so yeah. then the real part of epsilon should be like negative 
and the imaginary part should be very high because of the losses. Is that correct? Yes, yes, exactly. But there, normally, as as you know, then in 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 microwave frequency, we uh, normally the imaginary part dominates. So we don't care about the real part because then we just take the minus j uh, uh, sigma over omega, which comes nicely as a as a approximation of this Drude model. If you put in those losses. Uh, and then let the omega go to very low frequencies, uh, like for metals, because the plasma frequency is so much higher than microwave frequencies, then it normally gives you only the, the imaginary part. Okay, thank you. So I think now we have a few more questions. And I, okay. think, uh, I think our past chair, Ordhendu Kundu, has something to say, has raised his hand. So Okay, so please, let's, let's yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I think he will ask his question, or I think there's something to say, or maybe he has accidentally raised his hand. I don't know. Let's see. But I have one more question. Uh, this yeah. might be because I have not read properly about surface plasmons, but what is the main difference between a surface plasmon and a surface wave? Because I know that for a surface plasmon, one of the SLN should be negative. But what is the other difference? Ah, yeah, well, very good. Yes, surface wave. Yeah, right. That's a very good point because that is connected. But then there are surface waves which are then um, so. so um, wave is of course always a thing that has a propagation constant, attenuation constant along the surface. So, for example, a Zenek wave. We have many surface waves in in radio wave propagation, like uh, waves go over the sea surface or the moist ground and so on but the surface plasmon is localized so it is always on the on the uh, somehow fixed to the uh, um, to the very small nanoparticle or particle which is very small compared to the wavelength but uh, anyway using these type of things we can then uh, also make make um, uh, surface space uh, modify the properties of the surface space by 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 making use of the localized surface plasmons. But 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 in principle that is a localized thing, whereas the surface wave al always is a wave wave type of thing. Okay, I understand. So we have some questions. Should I read them out or? Uh, oh, okay. Like... Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. So the first question is: uh, Does the plasmonic waves depend on the size and shape of materials? Okay, okay. So the, the the right, yes, 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 they do because the if we talk now about this um, localized surface plasmon, as you remember, in the most pure form, it was like the static concept, which would means that this I say had twenty nanometer silver sphere, and in optical frequencies we we had that. But if the size starts to increase, then the properties of the of the of the plasmon, uh, it, it it its sharpness. I mean, it's like the Q factor becomes lower. It becomes softer resonance, and the maximum becomes lower. And then also its frequency changes. So as I talked about this red shift and so on. So so that is uh, that is uh, one. But as you mentioned the shape of course the shape is extremely important so if i didn't have time but that is very fascinating with if i start to squeeze the sphere into disc or uh, or or stretch it into a needle then there will be a even more stronger uh, change in character of the plasmonic frequency and that is uh, perhaps the most effective way of, of affecting those so the answer is absolutely yes Okay, so the next question is how increasing the frequency reduces the resolution. Um, or uh, yes, uh, yeah. If you mean to, to, at least when I was talking about the, the the first principles of homogenization, so like my snow thing in microwaves, I don't care about the uh, detailed structure, but then I mean. If I would like to know a more detailed structure, so it is exactly like an optical microscope. I have to go, and I, I cannot go beyond the resolution of the optical waves. I have to take an electron microscope and so on. So this is just like I, I would say that this is the way of, of the thing that the domain of the mixing formulas is then uh, 
uh, uh, like limited above at a certain frequency because higher than that we cannot no longer talk about this effective medium and then there will be more scattering effects and in a way the resolution is 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 uh, is uh, so the resolution i would say uh, coarsely the the wave or half wavelength of the of the wave there okay so the next question is in normal microwave integrated circuits maxwell garner's principle is not usually used is um, it correct uh, right so if you take integrated circuits then I guess there you don't need too much of the material modeling. Uh, I, I think then the silicon, uh, I guess, which is used there, or some other galimarsenide and those materials, they they are so. Uh, so the business of microfabrication is such a high level thing. I mean, so clean rooms and so that they, the, the the randomness is a bad thing there. I think there are like really monocrystal and and monolithic type of things, for which. Uh, the size is the atomic size, and you don't need to use Maxwell Garnet at all. You just use the 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 the, the given permittivity, conductivity, and parameters of, of of silicon and so on. So in in those, I, I would say that there Maxwell Garnet is not too too much in use. But but then of course if if, if this is more like a uh, in, in, in business, when you talk about, um, say, for microwave um, uh, applications, then things like we have like millimeter size of, of, of grains and, and droplets, which are, of course, much more macroscopic than the materials where, for, from which these, these microwave monolithic uh, circuits are made. Okay, so uh, we have the next question. Where can we use plasmonic resonance? Oh, very good. Yeah, that is. A, I think that there are quite a lot of lot, a lot of applications pe 